My name is Richard Moorhead. I'm a professor of law and professional ethics here at UCL in the Faculty of Laws. And uh, tonight it's my uh, pleasure to introduce uh, the guests this evening. Um, tonight's a conversation about legal professional pri privilege, and I'm delighted firstly to introduce Stephen, Stephen Mason, honorary professor here, and a leading, if not the leading light, in the legal services regulation, both in this country and elsewhere. And he's agreed to lead the conversation. When Stephen and I dreamt up the idea, we were kind of, I don't know if we were drawing straws or, or what we were doing, uh, as to who got the pleasure, but also the hard intellectual work of, of, uh, of uh, comparing, leading the conversation. So thank you, Stephen. Uh, Stephen, as many of you would, will know, is leading a review of legal services regulation hosted by the Centre of Ethics and Law. Uh, for those of you who don't know, the Centre exists to foster discussion, insight and research into crucial issues at the interface of ethics and law, and legal professional privilege is one such issue, very <coughs> topical at the minute, uh, as it was when we invited Lord Newberger. Uh, and we have, I think it's fair to say, welcomed many illustrious guests over the years, but none, if I may say so, more illustrious than Lord Newberger. Uh, uh, <laughs> I say that even though he read chemistry uh, at Oxford, uh, and my dad always said I should be a chemist, and I was kind of like, now I see why. Uh, and then spent three years as an investment banker before being called to the bar in 1975. Uh, he practiced largely in property law uh, and took silk in 1987. His career started off slowly, as you'll see in a minute. Yeah, nine years later, he was appointed a High Court judge, sitting in the Chancery Division. And only eight years later, he was made a Lord Justice of Appeal. Things then really started to pick up. Three years, and he was a law lord. And two years more, he was appointed to one of the most senior positions in the judiciary, the Master of the Rolls. Uh, three years on again, and he became the extremely widely respected president of the United Kingdom Supreme Court, a position from which he retired last year. <coughs> Um, that's not the most impressive thing about him, though. Uh, as I'm sure we all know, the most impressive thing about him is that all three of his brothers are professors. Uh, not professors of law, though. So they can't quite have everything. Uh, he's gone back into practice as an arbitrator, I think that's right, uh, at One Essex Court. And his other work reflects a, a very wide range of interests. He's an honorary fellow of the Royal Society, an honorary member of the Royal Institute of Chartered Surveyors, uh, a previous board member for the University of the Arts and a trustee and then chairman of the Schizophrenia Trust and also chairman, I think, of the Magna Carta Trust. Uh, uh, he has also taken a keen interest in diversity in the profession and IT and modernisation in the court system. And I believe also he quite likes meeting law students and having his picture taken for Twitter. Selfies? No? <laughs> maybe not. Maybe I'm not picking up that vibe. I thought maybe I'd, <laughs> I thought maybe I'd seen that on, but maybe I, maybe I misspoke there. So, what is that? so Lord Newberger, you're, you're most welcome. Stephen, thank you very much. I'm looking forward to a really exciting and interesting evening. Thank you very much, Richard, and welcome from me, too, to Lord Newberger. Uh, th this was one of those things all those months ago that seemed like a very good idea at the time when Richard and I were talking about it. Uh, and, and, and here we are, and it's still, I think, a very good and, uh, uh, as we'll hear, timely um, idea. So we're here, we're here to talk about legal professional privilege in its various guises uh, and to look at some of the decisions that have been made uh, by the courts over the years. But uh, I, I'm, I'm going partly to assume that most people who are here will understand what legal professional privilege is, but it did occur to me that some might have signed up for it and wandered in uh, and, and perhaps a little bit of a recap might not go amiss. So, legal professional privilege has been described in the House of Lords as a fundamental human right that's long established in common law. That was Lord Hoffman in the Morgan Grenfell case uh, in 2003. So it's seen as a public policy issue with a rationale founded on the rule of law. It is, it's about encouraging clients, who, or those who might become clients of lawyers, essentially <coughs> to put all of their cards on the table to have a full and frank discussion with their legal advisors about their legal rights and obligations, and that hopefully uh, will further uh, the, the, the rule of law by having well-informed clients who decide to do the right thing, or at least if they decide to do the wrong thing, 
they do it with their eyes wide open. Once it exists, legal professional privilege creates an unqualified assurance of lawyer-client confidentiality and of non-disclosure by the lawyer of what has been said in those conversations. And that outweighs another public policy uh, issue, which is the interests of the courts in having all of the evidence in front of them so that they can make a right decision, either on civil rights or on criminal liability. And this is one of those issues where two public interest rights, in a sense, conflict uh, and absent criminality, fraud, or some other iniquity, which we might come back to, uh, the right is absolute and the court cannot insist on disclosure of privileged information. We seem now to have established that legal professional privilege is a <coughs> single integral privilege but has two subheads, litigation privilege and legal advice privilege. Again, we'll come back to a suggestion that Lord Phillips made in the Court of Appeal in 2004 that maybe legal advice privilege should need reconsidering. But that, I hope, is enough of a, a, a recap of the principles or the fundamentals of uh, legal professional privilege um, for those who either needed a retread or have heard it for the first time. But Lord Nieberger, um, you might have some introductory comments you want to make before we start diving into some of the fundamental issues. Well, it occurred to me that um, this was a remarkably well-timed event. It never occurred to me that if I was going to make some introductory remarks, I would be referring to Brexit, although one seems to, seems to be very difficult to avoid referring to it in any context at all, in any context, but not to refer to it in any context. But it, it's relevant because, of course, yesterday there was a humble address to Parliament uh, by the opposition requiring the government to reveal the legal advice it was receiving, had received, was going to receive, in relation to the <coughs> deal, the exit deal. And it highlights the fact that here we have a classic case where the client, that is the executive, if you like, ministers, are claiming privilege in re as against the rest of the country. And it raises quite an interesting constitutional problem, or arguably series of constitutional problems or teases, <laughs> such as the notion that the executive for this purpose has a separate existence from the people, from Parliament, uh, from you and me. And the traditional English constitution, <coughs> UK constitutional view is that he does. And therefore any advice it has, whether it's about the Iraq war or Brexit, is a private matter between it, the client, the ministers, and uh, <coughs> the Attorney General or whoever else is advising. Um, the other point that it brings home to us is that we have the supremacy of Parliament, that the government recognising, uh, ministers recognising that they were going to lose the vote in Parliament trying to maintain privilege, um, they basically have waived it. Uh, but it illustrates very sharply how in a country without a constitution such as one finds in every other country except for Israel and New Zealand, uh, you don't have a, a system whereby uh, the government, the ministers could go to court and say, despite the fact that Parliament has said we have to produce the advice, we don't have to because the constitution protects the executive. The third point that occurs to me is it's an interesting precedent. Are we now going to move from the government being able, ministers being able to hide uh, behind pri privilege <coughs> when they get legal advice, or will it now become standard for the government has to have to reveal its legal advice? And is this a good thing or a bad thing? Now, so far, everything I've said is going off at a tangent because it's not really what we're talking about this evening, but it seemed to be quite an interesting point to start with. Also, Stephen was good enough to give me a note of what he was going to say. And please, by the way, first names, not <laughs> Um he, he said that um, he gave me a note of what he was going to say as an introduction. I, I don't think I can better it. Um, or, there's only one point that occurs to me, which is more of a general conceptual point. Uh, as he started off by saying, privilege, legal, professional privilege, both advice privilege and litigation privilege are seen as 
absolutely fundamental principles. But as we will see, and as anyone who studied the subject will see, the cases are full of judges saying how important and how high a principle it is. But when you look at how it's applied, it, it is very much on the basis of, at least when it comes to the boundaries, pragmatic practical decisions, uh, which on analysis are based more on pragmatism than any sort of principle. So while the kernel of the principle is there, the boundaries of it, the extent of it, and the rules which apply to it are very much made up on the hoof, very common law. So those are my preliminary <laughs> thoughts. Thank you. Um, we are planning to leave some time at the end of this session for questions from you, so I hope you, you'll, you'll forgive us if we just chat for a while and then uh, I'll, I'll open it up to, uh, to, to the rest of you. Um, so legal professional privilege requires a lawyer-client relationship. Um, I, I'd like, if I may, to start with the prudential judgment, which was one that you were uh, involved in in the Supreme Court. Um, and, and in that judgment, you referred to a previous comment by the then Lord Justice Bingham that, that the expression legal professional privilege or legal professional privilege <coughs> um, was unhappy. And one of the issues uh, in, in that case, of course, was how far professional privilege could apply to someone who was not legally qualified. And, and if I may, I'd just I'd like to set up as a counter um, here that Lord Clark, in his dissenting judgment, gave what I thought was a very telling example, uh, because the case involved whether or not uh, tax advice or advice on tax law given by a chartered accountant could be privileged in the same way as it would have been had it been given by a lawyer. And he posited two, two, two clients who put the same question on the same facts, first to Freshfields as a law firm, or second to PwC as an accounting firm. And let's assume for a moment that they both get the same advice back. Under the law, as it's understood, the Freshfields advice is privileged, but the PwC advice isn't. And that looks rather odd if the public interest here is in disclosure of the client in order to get professional help on a, on a, on a legal matter. So it, it rather looks as though the Supreme Court has affirmed the notion of a legal profession attracting privilege rather than the giver of professional advice on a legal issue. And, and it just, just seems to me as though maybe the public policy issues are slightly at odds in those conclusions. It's always quite interesting to go back and look at a judgment that you wrote a few years <laughs> ago and that you haven't had a reason to look at uh, until an event like this. And um, I, I suppose I'd put judgments into three categories. Those where you think, yeah, I was right. Those where you think, how did I reach that conclusion? <laughs> and those where you think, yes, it was a very difficult issue and... I may well have been right, but it's a difficult issue. And the prudential case is very much in the third category. Mm. I don't approve of judges talking about cases in the second category, because if you do think you were wrong, it puts the law in an awful mess if you in the Supreme Court are given a judgment saying X, and then you outside court say X is wrong. Um, because a barrister or solicitor relying on what you said in court uh, in front of a high court judge or county court judge puts the judge in a terrible difficulty if, he's a, if the barrister or solicitor's opponent can say yes but that's what Lord Newbagger said in the case but five years later at a meeting at UCL he said he thought he was wrong <laughs> but fortunately I'm not in that position on prudential I think it was a very difficult decision I think that the dissenting judgments of Lord Sumption and Lord Clark both of whom said that you simply look at the nature of the advice um, and said a bit more than that, but they relied heavily, quite understandably, on the point that Stevens emphasised, that if you get the same advice from a, a legal advice about tax, whether you call it legal advice or not, it is legal advice as the effect of the taxing legislation, the revenue legislation, on your liability to tax. If you get the same advice from Freshfields and from um, PwC, it's a bit curious that it's privileged in the former case, 
and not in the latter case. And that's a very telling point. Now, I would say that actually on analysis, looking at the case, cases, it seems to me that the issue was not about the nature of the advice. We were all agreed on the nature of the advice. It had to be legal advice. Sometimes that's difficult to define, but it had to be advice of a legal nature. What we both wanted, both the majority and the minority wanted to do, was to limit it, limit the sort of people who could give it, or the sort of people from whom it would be privileged. The five of us said it had to be a lawyer. The two other ones said it had to be somebody who was professionally qualified in a profession which habitually gave legal advice. Now, I think that the two reasons, principal reasons, that we didn't go along with the attractive solution which Stephen summarized was first, that actually we felt that the law up to now, if you looked at the cases, had said it had to come from a lawyer. The advice had to come from a lawyer. And it would have involved changing the law as it was understood uh, to have been, uh, to change, uh, to, to, to extend it to accountants and others giving legal advice. I think that uh, it's fair to say, if you look at the cases, they all assumed it was only lawyers. Nobody had actually said it, it can be other people or it can't be other people, but we would be expanding the law um, if we were to take the view that the majority took. The minority took, I beg your pardon, Lord Sumption and Lord Clark took. And I think there were two reasons why we didn't do it. Second, uh, firstly, we felt that uh, it was a bit difficult to define as a matter of policy what group of people you would extend it to beyond lawyers. I think we felt that Lord Sumption's definition of somebody in a profession uh, who habitually gave legal advice was a little difficult because if you look at some professions, say accountants, um, some members of the accountancy profession habitually give legal advice. But do you then start dividing up and working out what sort of um, person within the accountancy profession this person is, etc.? And why should it simply be somebody who's professional rather than somebody who's got highly developed experience? This all seemed to us to be questions of policy which, while we could have decided, uh, we felt it was better for Parliament. The second reason we felt that we shouldn't be interfering with the law, or extending the law as understood to be, was because there were a number of statutes passed by Parliament which clearly assumed that it was only lawyers who could give uh, privileged legal advice. And I, I think that um, the most telling one, in a way, was the 2007 Act, uh, which specifically extended legal advice privilege to patent agents, trademark agents, conveyances, and one other group. Um, and that would have been a perfectly pointless exercise if privilege already applied to them. I can't say those arguments were unanswerable in the sense that nobody could seriously disagree with them. Lord Sumption did disagree with them and Lord Clark disagreed with them and they are not people one likely ignores. But, nonetheless, the majority felt that it was better left to Parliament. On the issue of were we actually protecting the legal profession, I think if you want to be unkind to us, you could say in practice we were, because we were saying, go to a lawyer, don't go to an accountant, because if you go to a lawyer, you'll get privileged advice. If you go to an accountant, you won't get privileged advice. But that was a consequence of what we were doing. It wasn't the intention behind it. The intention behind it was to say, you, who, what sort of advice is protected? And we said, it's advice from a lawyer. I think there was also another practical point which weighed with me. I'm not sure how much it weighed with other colleagues. I, I thought that actually what constitutes legal advice is a little difficult to identify on the margins. Some sorts of advice you might say, well, is that really legal advice or is that practical advice or tactical advice? And I thought if you limited um, the uh, nature of privilege to advice from lawyers, it was easier to say, well, as the advice comes from a lawyer, even though it's tactical, it's going to be treated as legal advice. But once you expand it to other professions, you're not merely going to expand the number of people who can give privileged advice. In practice, you're going to extend the amount of privileged advice. So I think it's a difficult one. I 
can't say, as I say, we were clearly right and the minority was clearly wrong in my mind. I think it was a difficult one and I think I probably would have decided it the same way as I did if it was up before me now. You mentioned the 2007 Act, um, Richard said as the introduction, it's a particular interest of mine, so can I yeah. just, just, just pursue that a, a little? So I, I know what you say about privilege having been expressly extended in, in, in certain circumstances, uh, but one of the things the, the 2007 Act did was set up a different uh, structure for the authorization of those who wished to offer legal services. It's structured around the reserve legal activities, and, and I and others would say that that in itself is problematic. Yeah. Um, but it, but it, it does provide a framework for authorization. Yeah. So the concerns you had about extending the definition of privilege and the application of privilege to other professions or activities ordinarily involving the, uh, the delivery of legal ad advice could be avoided by relying on the Act to say, if someone is authorised under the Act to, to practise any one of the reserved activities, there is a fact of authorisation that doesn't then require the courts to, to, to make a judgement about whether they happen to fall within an, an area of activity or a different profession um, that ordinarily gives, gives legal advice. So you could, you, you'd say the Act pro would provide you with a degree of certainty where you were keen to avoid uncertainty. And, of course, since the 2013 judgment in Prudential, um, the Institute of Chartered Accountants in England and Wales has become uh, a regulator under the Act. It can authorise chartered accountants to deliver probate activities. And if they do that, the, they are then uh, covered by, by the privilege uh, extension that, that you refer to. So... In a sense, we've now, we've now got an even more bizarre situation, in a sense, because some chartered accountants will be privileged in the professional advice they give if they're authorised, uh, and, and some won't. So ra rather than none of them being privileged, we've now got, I think, a rather uncomfortable halfway house. That was a point which, being five years ago or six years ago, I can't say with confidence, but I think it was a point that wasn't closely examined in argument. I suspect that it was a point that could have been deployed, and I don't think, unless I misremember, wasn't deployed much in, in the Sumptions, or no, it Lord Clark or Lord Sumptions argument. I think, I suspect that they didn't run it, either because it didn't occur to them because it wasn't run before us, or because they were actually adopting a very principled common law approach and saying the legislature can look after itself and make the rules it wants. We, the judges, this privilege being a common law concept, are going to make the rules that we think are appropriate. Um, I think the idea you had, and, and therefore Jonathan Sumption had to um, find a, a satisfactory formulation mm. for identifying as a matter of common law rather than statute who uh, could um, give legal advice uh, at, on a privileged basis. And I think that the truth is that the danger of falling back on the statute, and it may be why, the, if, it, if I'm right and remember rightly, the argument wasn't run in front of us, was because the moment you start relying on the statute, it can be said, and maybe this is a bit smart alley, but it can be said, well, if you rely on the statute, you've got the seeds of your own destruction, because if you're taking your stand on the statute, why does the statute go out of its way to give specific people who wouldn't otherwise need it? Mm. Um, the sort of uh, the, the, the right to uh, privilege or advice from a specific group of people uh, carry, to carry privilege if, if it would have carried it anyway. I think the answer, I think my answer would be to, to you is, is not so much in relation to, to the prudential case, but that, that actually your point gives Parliament a very good way of um, extending the privilege. Mm -hmm. Uh, in a way which doesn't cause too much problem and enables you to identify very easily whether somebody is within the category yes. of person. Uh, and I think probably you've given Parliament a very um, easy way of dealing with this. I suspect MPs have something else to think about at the moment, but in due course, <laughs> I think it might be a, a 
an interesting exercise where no doubt the Law Society and Bar Council will have something to say yes, about indeed. extending it statutorily, but yeah, why not? But, it, but if, if, if privilege is such a fundamental principle for, for courts and for society, and, it, and if, as has been said in the House of Lords, it's a judge-made development, it, 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 suggesting that the extension of it is really a matter for Parliament, sort of pulls back from that, doesn't it? Isn't, isn't, aren't the courts being a little timid at that point? I think, I think timid is a word that occurred to me when I was looking at my judgment. Um, <laughs> if you wanted to be unkind, you could say it was timid, yes. I wasn't trying to be unkind. No, 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 <laughs> they weren't, but it, 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 it's a word I actually wrote down when I was um, thinking about it. it. It could be said to be timid, and it's a perfectly fair point that, that it was developed by the judges. But... On the other hand, Parliament has looked at, and indeed there have been, if I remember rightly, reports on whether it should be extended to tax advisors, mm. and the government rejected that. And you could still argue that, that uh, with considerable force, that never mind what the government thought was worth doing or Parliament thought was right, this is a common law principle, and uh, the courts should get on with applying it in accordance with what they think is right. Mm. And that was the assumption view, and as I say, it's a powerful, powerful argument. Yep. But we, the majority, felt the combination of factors I've identified made it more appropriate for it to be looked at. And one of the problems about extending the law, if you're a judge, is that you don't have the same opportunity to have multiple representations from all sorts of different interested parties and call them before you to explain what the implications might be like a parliamentary committee or um, uh, uh, lawmakers in, in government. On the whole, you are faced with the arguments in relation to the particular case. And if you want to be unkind, you can say we were pathetically timid. If you want to be kinder, you can say we were properly cautious. <laughs> <laughs> we'll accept that note of caution then, until Parliament looks at it and <coughs> takes a different view. Um, can we shift to uh, litigation privilege? Um, because that requires uh, litigation to be in, to actually to be happening or to be in reasonable contemplation. Um, it applies to adversarial proceedings and to communications whose dominant purpose is connected to those uh, proceedings. It seems to me in today's complex world, it, all of those elements create some challenges. And if, if you're trying as a as a socially and legally responsible organisation to, to understand when something might have gone wrong, you would hopefully responsibly in investigate. But, but the way in which um, the courts now look at those elements and indeed who is the client in those circumstances arguably creates some quite difficult practical challenges for, for organisations. Again, it, are the courts being a little too timid in... In, in supporting organisations doing the, the most responsible things and finding out exactly what happened, what did go wrong, can we put it right, without then exposing themselves to all of that dirty laundry, if it is dirty, being, <coughs> being out in, in, in court in the future? Well, I think that's a very big question. Like the last question, it highlights the fact that you have a principle which is developed in the 18th century when mm -hmm. the world was much simpler. And if accountants existed, they didn't give legal advice, and um, litigation was m much more straightforward. There was hardly any regulation, um, and um, deferred prosecution agreements weren't uh, on, on the table and so on. And trying to force this sort of simple concept developed in a much simpler world in, to fit in with all the implications of, of complex organizations, regulations, and so on, is, is difficult. Um, I mean, I was quite struck by the fact that in going slightly off at a tangent on deferred prosecution agreements, those are arrangements whereby um, the cynical would say it's a money-raising exercise for the government, because what happens is you get some, often it's bribery, company involved in bribery being prosecuted, if the company fesses up and says it'll never do it again and pays the government a large amount of money, uh, the government doesn't prosecute.
so the government makes money, it doesn't have to lose money prosecuting and take the risk that it'll fail, the company doesn't spend a great deal of time fighting the case. But one of the things that struck me about that is at the moment um, the company is expected to come clean mm. and if it isn't prepared to waive privilege that counts against it. This seems to me to be fundamentally inconsistent with the whole idea of privilege. I remember as a judge mm. um, sitting on a case quite early on where the plaintiff said to the defendant what advice did you get? And the defendant said, I'm not going to tell you it was legal advice, it was privileged. And in closing argument, the plaintiff's counsel argued that the fact he wasn't, he was in, accepted the defendant was entitled to waive privilege, was entitled to insist on privilege because it was legal advice, but said the fact he didn't tell the court what it was should, was, should, should, should be uh, lead to a, a, the inference against him that it was um, unfavorable advice or advice that harmed his case. I immediately said, and it turns out there are cases that support this, that if you start saying I'll draw adverse inferences from you not waiving privilege, then that undermines the whole value of privilege. Mm -hmm. But yet in deferred prosecution agreements, if you don't waive privilege, then the courts may very well say, or the government may say, we're not uh, going ahead with the deferred prosecution agreement, and even if the government does, the court might hold it against you. But that's a small example, but one that's quite telling to my mind. More broadly, I think the point particular you have in mind is this difficult question of companies being expected to fess up generally mm. to the regulators mm. about things that have gone wrong, and they're expected to investigate. And I think your point, which you mentioned to, to me uh, before, which I think is very telling, is that what happens if a company suspect something is going on that's wrong, there's a lot to be said for the company, as you say, holding off, mm -hmm. investigating <laughs> what's going on until it's threatened with legal proceedings. Because <coughs> once it's threatened with legal proceedings, then it can say all our investigations are privileged. We don't have to disclose any of yes. this. Or it leads to rather artificial ar ar arrangements and communication that, that are sort of force-fed through legal teams, internal and external which might be a very cumbersome and expensive way of, and unnecessary way yeah. of doing things in the ordinary run. Yeah. Yeah. Basically, playing the system. Indeed. Trying yeah. to ensure that your communications are privileged. Mm. Yeah. Mm. I think there isn't a very easy way around that, but I think that, I suspect that while you can't draw adverse inferences, in my view, from the fact that somebody claims privilege, I think you can arguably draw adverse inferences from the fact they don't investigate earlier than they should with a view to claiming privilege. Because I think that's, that's one step too remote from relying on privilege. But I'm not sure you can go much further than that other, dare I say it, than through statute. But then it becomes very sensitive mm -hmm. as to how you, you mm -hmm. deal with that. But I mean the recent ENRC and, uh, case um, is an example of a company being able, as according to the Court of Appeal, to claim privilege because by the time its lawyers were, were carrying out investigations, there was enough of a threat of prosecution yeah. for the company to be able to say one of the purposes, the dominant purpose of carrying out the investigation through lawyers was with a view to prospective litigation. And um, if, as the judge had held, that wasn't the predominant purpose, then they would have had to produce the documents. Mm. And I agree, mm. you put your finger on a, on a, I, on a problem. I, I, yeah, absolutely. For, for general counsel, it's, it's a minefield. Um, you, you referred to the ENRC case, and the, the Court of Appeal seemed to go on an interesting journey in, it, in its judgment on uh, the definition of a, of a client. <laughs> Um, s started off wanting to do different things and then and said, well, no, we, we can't. But then pretty much ended up saying, well, if, if we could, we would disagree. D again, do you, do, you, do, you, do you think in future that, that might get a different or lead to a different outcome? There was a wonderful case which many of you will have come across called the Three Rivers case which um, 
was most famous for being one of the longest cases ever when it finally got to court. <coughs> Somebody, um, the, the liquidators of BCCI um, were suing um, basically for um, uh, 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 the Bank of England for having been guilty of misfeasance in public office. And there was a welter of attempts to get documents which were held to be privileged or not held to be privileged. And there was Three Rivers Number 5, which gives you some idea of the <laughs> litigation, uh, went to the Court of Appeal and they produced a result. I don't know what, what you think of the result, but I've done a lot of talking. You're a real expert on this area. <laughs> well, what did you think of it? <laughs> Well, I, I think I'd have been with the, with the Court of Appeal in the ENLC. I think it, it, at, a, at a more pragmatic level, um, the, the way in which corporates these days are structured, the way they organise their management communication and the information flows and throw into that the, the, the problems of, excuse me, of globalisation. Um, I, I think if, if, if the definition is as narrow as, as it appeared to be in Three Rivers, then again, at the level of running a business on a day-to-day -day basis, I think it creates restrictions that are just too difficult. Yeah, so the, the issue was really how a company, by definition, has to act through human beings. Yes, exactly. Yeah. And the question is, if a particular human being uh, goes to the lawyer for legal advice on behalf of the company, or in connection with litigation goes to the lawyer, um, to what extent uh, does the uh, human being have to be the agent of the company for the purpose of the litigation and how generously do you interpret that? I mean, that's a slight oversimplification. But the Court of Appeal interpreted it very narrowly in Three Rivers Number 5. Um, the, um, the Bank of England lost that one and they tried to go to the House of Lords, um, that, which was because it was before the days of the Supreme Court, and the House of Lords refused them permission to go to the Court of Appeal and to go to the Supreme Court or the House of Lords. Many people assume that when the House of Lords and now the Supreme Court refuses leave, they're signalling that the decision was right. That's not the case. Sometimes permission is refused because they think it's right. Sometimes, however, it's refused because either they're very busy and they've got too much to do or they don't think it's a suitable case or because interlocutory decisions, which are, do we give leave or not? You look at the papers, you don't dig into the papers in the same way as if you're considering the decision for the point of view of actually deciding the appeal. Sometimes you're more likely to get your decision wrong and you may refuse leave when you should grant it. And that has happened, inevitably, in the past. Sometimes permission's been granted when it shouldn't have been and judges being human contrary to what some give the impression, um, <laughs> it does happen, they sometimes go wrong. And I think on number five, maybe they should have given permission, but maybe they felt the point had been so litigated, the case had been so litigated, they should give other litigants a chance to come to the Supreme Court, the House of Lords, and there is an element of fairness in that. So anyway, whatever the reason they refused permission, Three Rivers number six went to the House of Lords and counsel for the Bank of England, a um, character called Jonathan Sumption, um, <laughs> argued that they should take the opportunity to say that Three Rivers Number 5 was wrong. But the House of Lords said, we don't have to decide for the purpose of deciding Three Rivers Number 6 whether the Court of Appeal was right in Three Rivers Number 5, and therefore we won't do so. But don't assume we're saying Three Rivers Number 5 was right. Then, in ENRC, decided a couple of weeks ago by the Court of Appeal, in a totally different case, they were asked to say that Three Rivers Number 5 was wrong. And if you read the judgment, as Stephen says, it's quite interesting, because initially they say, uh, and they set out the arguments generally, and they say, and we were asked to say that Three Rivers Number 5 was wrong, and we really don't think it's appropriate for us to say that at all. Three Rivers number five is a decision of the Court of Appeal. We are normally bound by decisions of the Court of Appeal. The House of Lords have said they won't overrule it unless 
a case which bang on point comes to them, we shouldn't be tangling with it. So you think, right, that's that. But then much later in the judgment, they say, well, now we have to face up to a point where it's said, which we don't have to decide, whether three rivers number five was right or not. And if it's right, then we would decide this point this way, but if it's wrong, we'd decide it that way. We don't actually need to decide the point at all. And they go on to say, more or less, we think three rivers number five was wrong. <laughs> Quite what we do, if we had to decide whether it was wrong or not, we're not sure, because the Court of Appeal shouldn't normally depart from its own decisions. So they've left it up in the air, but three rivers is being pushed, number five is being pushed more and more into, well, those of you old as me will remember jukebox jury, into the miss rather than the hit category. <laughs> But then it's been dealt with abroad in other, in other jurisdictions, hasn't it? it? It's, it's been more sympathetically dealt with, I think, in, um, in, at least in Hong Kong. Yeah. Um, just before I open up to the, to the floor, because time is skipping by, can I, just come, I, I mentioned, um, again, from, from Three Rivers, that Lord Phillips has suggested that legal advice privilege might, might be um, worth reconsidering. Um, and if I may, I'll, just, I'll, I'll read out what he, what he said. So the justification for litigation privilege is readily understood. Where, however, litigation is not anticipated, it's not easy to see why communications with a solicitor should be privileged. Legal advice privilege attaches to matters such as the conveyance of real property or the drawing up of a will. It's not clear why it should. There would seem little reason to fear that if privilege were not available in such circumstances, communications between solicitor and client would be inhibited. Do you think he's got a point, or is he is a bit of a ju judicial outlier on that? Do I think I, he's got a point, or is he a judicial outlier? Both. Right. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, think, I, think, I think he's definitely got a point. Um, I think these days, it isn't immediately obvious. Sound, I'm sounding now as if I'm completely contrary to what I said in Prudential, but I'm talking about the matter purely in principle. But it's very difficult to see why should... He, going to a lawyer for advice uh, mean that the lawyer's advice is completely protected, whereas you go and see your doctor or go and see your accountant, um, it isn't protected. I mean, many people would feel more sensitive about the advice they get from their doctor than the advice mm -hmm. that they get from mm -hmm. their lawyer. Mm -hmm. And you look at the defences of legal professional privilege, um, Lord Broom goes on about the fact that it's very difficult and complicated but then says so medical and accountancy advice. And um, then it said, well, people have to be encouraged to lay their full case before the lawyer and be full and frank. But that's true when you go to the doctor or priest or, or an accountant. Um, I think it's the whole feeling that when you go to court, what you tell your lawyer should not be um, protected. It should, should be protected, or what your lawyer tells you. But that's litigation privilege on the whole. Um, there are times when I think the reason why, despite what Lord, what Lord Bingham said about it not being there to protect lawyers, I sometimes feel that, that, that the reason there is such a wide category or two relatively wide categories of litigation and legal advice privilege is because the law is made by judges and they were all lawyers. <laughs> um, but I think that's a slight oversimplification. But you could argue, coming back to Nick Phillips' point of view, that even litigation privilege is questionable. It isn't blindingly obvious what the rules should be. But I think it would be very inconvenient if, if litigation privilege didn't exist. Because, first of all, lawyers would never, you'd never seek advice and never give advice in writing because the advice would be disclosable. So it's a bit like the effect of the Freedom of Information mm. Act. Everything would be done Yes. by word of mouth. And then when you were asked in the witness box what your lawyer's advice was, you'd say you couldn't remember. Um, it, it would be a mess. So I think he's Indeed. right about yes. litigation privilege. Mm. But legal advice privilege, the general view is that partly, it's not so much because judges are lawyers, I hope, but I think we've all been brought up with the idea that legal advice privilege is a fundamental right. And um, it's so ingrained that that's why Nick Phillips is an outlier on this. Mm. But I think he's an outlier with some supporters, and I have some sympathy with his view. But I think it's so ingrained in, in our system that it could only be ending where we started, in a way. It could only be Parliament who got rid of it. 
Well, I suppose you, you, you could say that in the context of, uh, certainly of, of litigation privilege, mm. uh, there is a very real public interest in the courts being able to make the right decisions on whatever ev evidence is disclosable. What happens between someone and their priest or someone and their doctor is very much a private matter, which you, you would never expect to be aired in, in, in public. No, but on the other hand, anything which shuts out relevant material yeah. is, means that you are more likely to risk a yes. bad result. Yeah. But the, the interesting thing is the actual legal advice the lawyer gives is relevant. I mean, even if I'm arguing, if, if you're having an old point of law argued, the fact that a lawyer tells you you're right or wrong <laughs> isn't relevant. Yes. But if you tell the lawyer you did it, or you yes. can't remember whether you did it or not, and then in the witness box you say you certainly didn't, and the fact you told your lawyer you couldn't remember is pretty yes, significant. Yes, indeed. If I may, I'll now open up to the floor, and if you could say who you are and where you're from, that would be helpful. Uh, David Smith from Anthony Gold Solicitors. Uh, thank you for a really interesting lecture, Lord Newberger. Um, you've talked about different types of privilege in relation to litigation. You haven't talked about uh, privilege in relation to alternative dispute resolution, and I'm particularly interested in whether you think, in, in particular, I'm, I'm, personally, I'm more interested in mediation privilege, um, but I'm hoping that, that, that hint now that, now that you have, have approaching from a different, a different vested interest potentially, you might be of the view that uh, that, uh, that that privilege should attach more strongly to uh, alternative dispute resolution, or, or do you think that the existing <coughs> privilege categories are sufficient? Well, it seems to me, off to some extent, off the top of my head, that mediation privilege should be covered in the normal way by without prejudice negotiation privilege in the sense that a mediation is an attempt to settle the case and all the arguments in favor of um, without prejudice negotiations even if they're not expressly stated to be without prejudice being privileged in the sense of you can't disclose them in the litigation uh, apply um, strongly to mediation. Um, I'm not sure, but because it's quite interesting, I don't take it personally, but I think mediation only started to come in after I became a judge. So um, I haven't got direct personal experience of mediation, um, although maybe I'll, I'll get some as a mediator, time will tell. Anybody interested, please get in touch. <laughs> um, um, more seriously, I think um, uh, that I I in terms of uh, the rules, unless there's something specific that I don't know about, I'd have thought the general principle that you can't rely on what was said in trying to negotiate a settlement of a case uh, would apply to negotiations and discussions of mediation. But I don't know. I don't know whether you or whether Stephen Mason can think of any specific or special features of mediation which require special consideration. No, I can't. I think. I think arguably the public interest issues are, are, are different in mediation. Arbitration might be different. Oh, yeah. but mediation, I'm. I'm not sure. Um, moving swiftly on. Any more hands in the air? There's, if you can reach. I'll, I'll work left and then can make the geography easy. So it's right in the middle there, just to make it a challenge. Uh, David Simpson, uh, Bar Mutual Indemnity Fund. Um, who is, who, um, and we're not Lord Newbury's insurer. I should just make that Sorry? Clear. We're not your insurer. I just make plain to everyone here. Bar Mutual is not Lord Newberger's uh, insurer because he's, uh, even though he's, at, he's, he's um, conducting his arbitration practice from one Essex court. Um, this is a question that's probably more likely to, um, to uh, an answer to come from Lord Newberger, but uh, uh, Professor Mason. That's fine, that's so. why he's here. Um, <laughs> I wanted to, to we've obviously. Uh, Could you put Mason, the microphone a bit closer yeah, to your mouth? Professor Mason I'm mentioned sorry. about how. Um, the LPP is a, basically a statement of public policy, and obviously that one of the cases where that's and every, it, it defeats everything. And the classic example of that is the Derby Magistrates case in 1995. Now that was a case where um, the accused in a murder trial wanted to lead a confession, which uh, by some <coughs> another suspect, which had been made to that other suspect's solicitor, and the House of Lords ruled 
even though that would obviously, was obviously highly probative evidence in the, in the uh, accused murder trial, it was not admissible. If we, say, turn the clock back 40 years from 1995, and that had arisen in 1955, when the death penalty was very much still, in, still available for, for, as a sentence, indeed it was the, the compulsory sentence for, a, for mur a murder conviction, do you think that, that the um, conf conflict of, of high, issue, um, high issues of principle would be decided the same way as it was in the Derby Magistrates case? I wasn't in practice while the death penalty was in force. I started practice too late, so I can't speak from experience. I suppose I have had experience of the death penalty in a couple of a few Privy Council cases. But I suspect that what would have happened, and it's a typical fudge answer, I'm afraid, is that they would have come to the same conclusion, but the judge would have made sure, if there had been a conviction, that the Home Secretary knew about this document that the judge would have seen and any sentence of death would have been commuted to life imprisonment. But um, it's not a, it, 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 the Derby case does stick in one's craw a bit. It mm. is an extreme case, which you've described very well. Mm. Um, and it's the old problem uh, that often leads to bad decisions when strict application of the law, which is a good law for the general public and for the general maintenance of the rule of law and litigation produces an unfair, sometimes a very unfair result in a particular case. And judges sometimes cheat to get a result which seems fair and that fouls up the law. Occasionally a clever judge will find a way around it and um, manage to uphold the law but nonetheless get a just result. But sometimes you simply can't do it. Okay, so there's another question just here, and then hopefully we've got time for one more. One more. Yeah, uh, just, that's it, thank you. Uh, hello, I'm uh, Liam Lane, I'm on the bar course. Um, I'm interested to hear your thoughts on this. So the SFO are moving to um, prosecute more serious tax fraud cases. If the privilege is extended to tax advice, how will <coughs> that impact the trial? Because obviously will that then be privileged if it's then a tax fraud? So I'd be interested to hear your views on that if it is extended. If the advice is privileged, um, then subject to exceptional cases of fraud or dishonesty, um, of, and that, that they're, they're quite technical concepts mm -hmm. in a way. As you probably know, you can't just say somebody was fraudulent or dishonest, but you have to show it's, it's relevant fraud or dishonesty. But without going into that, the privilege is absolute. So the revenue or the prosecuting authorities couldn't use bring the advice before the court. But of course, if the advice helps the person who's accused, then, uh, and the advice was given to him or her, then he or she can waive the privilege and say, look, this is the advice I got. But you have to be careful before you waive privilege. As you will probably know, you can't just say, I'm going to waive privilege on paragraphs 6, 7, and 8 of this letter. <laughs> you either waive privilege on the letter or you we don't. don't. Mm -hmm. And sometimes if you waive privilege on a letter, you find you've waived privilege on the run of correspondence of which the letter is part. But in principle, the privilege, is, as Stephen Mason has said, is, is the person who's, that of the person who's been given the advice, and it's up to him or her, and solely up to him or her, whether it's waived or not. But otherwise, you can rely on it. I'm going for one final question. I'm sorry I've been sweeping this way. So there was a hand up there. I, I, yes, I know the mic's there, but the question's over there. <laughs> Just trying to ensure somebody gets some exercise. Uh, well, at least all, all segments of the room have then had a, had a chance. This will be the last question, though, I fear. Thank you. Um, John Mayton, Charity Commission for England and Wales. Um, you alluded to it earlier on. There's a whole plethora of legislation regarding provision of information and regulation of provision of information uh, 
requiring people to disclose information to other people for whatever purpose. And some of this is drafted expressly with carve-outs for privilege and some is not. Do you have a view on, generically speaking, how you would approach legislation about the disclosure of information which is silent on privilege and the extent to which privilege cuts across the word of parliament? I, I have a, a view which I'll express, although I'd like to look and see whether it is supported by the authorities. The general rule, which is beautifully expressed by Lord Hoffman in the Sims case of 2000, and also by Lord Stain, I think, in that case, is that general words in a statute cannot be invoked in order to deprive individuals of fundamental rights. The way he puts it is that if Parliament wants to deprive people through a statute of fundamental rights, then, or if, if a minister in legislation presented to Parliament wants to deprive people of fundamental rights, then the minister should say so in terms in the bill laid before Parliament and face up to the fa and make Parliament face up to the fact that it is taking away fundamental rights. Privilege, as Stephen Mason has said, is a fundamental right. And in my view, general words in a statute cannot be invoked to take it away. So that is my off-the-cuff answer. And when you go away, you'll probably find some case that blows it out of the water. <laughs> but I, I think that's the principle. I think, the, I think Morgan Grenfell may be consistent with that, yeah, the cool. Morgan Grenfell case. But I have to say it's off the cuff, that yeah. answer. I, just one, one final question, looking into the future. Yes. Um, we might conceive a world where artificial intelligence advances to the point where someone could make a full and frank disclosure to an algorithm and receive legal advice. Yes. Would that advice be privileged? <laughs> I'd leave it to the robot judge to do something. <laughs> <laughs> more, more, more seriously, I think, assuming there was a human judge um, and we hadn't written any fresh legislation or rules to deal with it, I think that You'd have to look. I mean, as you mentioned to me when we, when you raised it shortly before this started, um, this conversation started, um, one would have to look and see we, where the con which country mm. it, the advice was given, and that of course raises difficulties because it would all have been done electronic on a terminal. But I would have thought one would say that if the machine had been programmed to give legal advice and the advice that it gave was legal advice, then it would be subject to legal advice privilege. Which leaves us in the beautiful position that artificial intelligence attracts privilege, but accountants don't. I'll leave you to... <laughs> <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'll leave you to... to, <laughs> to ponder that. <laughs> David, thank you very much indeed for, for, for your... Uh,